Welcome to Seasoned. I'm Marisol Castro. And I'm Chef Plum. We have a great show for you today. We focused the last couple of weeks on really accomplished home cooks because we know all of you are cooking up a storm right now. And we couldn't be more thrilled to be part of the inspiration for that. Coming up this hour, Ina Garten. <laughs> we'll take a guess and say that, like me, she's probably one of your favorite home cooks. She is certainly in my top three. I learned how to cook, in part, from Ina and her cookbooks. Her 12th cookbook, her 12th, is out right now. It's called Modern Comfort Food. Perfect timing. This hour, we talk to Ina about many of the recipes in the new cookbook and some favorites from previous books. You know, because we couldn't resist. We also talk about some of the fun things she's done, like day drinking with Seth Meyers and hosting a dinner party with the cast of Mary Poppins. But first, you know we just had to ask Ina about that gigantic cosmopolitan, which in its own way was just the type of comfort we all needed back in April. Ina Garden, thank you for Zooming with us on Seasoned. It's so good to see you or to talk to you. <laughs> I know. These are crazy times. I feel like the last time I saw you in this sort of setting, you were making a cosmopolitan the size of my 11-year-old son. <laughs> so thank you for that. <laughs> It turned out I didn't know this, that everybody needed that cosmopolitan at that moment. It was April 1st. So we had just kind of, we were dealing with the lockdown, not really understanding, could we go shopping? Could we see people? What was going to happen here? And I just, I don't know, I was going to make a Cosmo and I thought, oh, I'm going to put it in this glass. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Little did I know how many people wanted that glass with the yeah, Cosmo in it. <laughs> myself included. Thank you for that because that was exactly the Zephyr we needed at the very beginning of lockdown and the pandemic. So, um, exactly. Which kind of leads me to the title of your of your latest cookbook, Modern Comfort Food. Did you have any idea when you put these recipes together that we would all be yearning for comfort food? Well, I did know one thing. I knew it was coming out a month before the election. And I knew we were going to be completely stressed out. I didn't know we would be in our houses, not being able to go anywhere except the grocery store. So everybody was cooking. I really couldn't imagine. And the layers of anxiety that we feel, you know, from everything that's going on in politics and the Supreme Court and the and racial justice issues. And I mean, the layers of, of stress are just extraordinary. Yeah. So I couldn't have predicted that. <laughs> I would say you did and just run with that. Add that to your <laughs> add that to your CV. That's Predict my story. yes, the yeah, predictor of strange occurrences in modern history. So, talk to us about this book. It's beautiful. Thank you. Can you even believe that you've done twelve cookbooks? Isn't that crazy? Yes. And I remember after my first book was published in 1999, and it was about my specialty food store. So I thought, well, that's great. That's all the recipes that I have, and I'm done. And my publisher called me right after the book came out, and it it had just taken off in a way that none of us could believe. And he said, we need another book right away. I was like, I'm out of recipes. There's no possibility I can write another book. And he said, we need it now. <laughs> I was like, okay, maybe I could write a book about my, with my catering recipes. I was, you know, when I had a specialty food store, I would do parties. So I collected all of the catering recipes and made that there for contested parties. But then I was scraping the bottom of the barrel. If somebody had said that, after 12 books, and I'm now working on the 13th, I could sit down and write a list of 75 or 100 ideas for recipes. I just wouldn't have believed it. But I guess it's kind of like exercise. The more you do it, the better you are at it. Mm -hmm. So it's been pretty amazing. You know, I have to, Marisol, I have to apologize. I'm totally fanboying out again. Like I'm quiet, <laughs> like my heart's pounding. Like I'm sitting here looking at an icon talking to me about food and, and That's my so sweet. mind Thank is going you. blank. <laughs> uh, you know, I know, one of the things I find most amazing, whether it's watching you on TV or checking out these amazing cookbooks, the way you have the recipe in your head is mind numbing to me. Like every time I've watched, you know, I've done tons of demos. I never remember, oh, it's a cup of this, a tablespoon of this. The way you keep all of that in your brain, your brain just must be one big encyclopedia of all your cookbooks. <laughs> I'll let you, you in can't... on the dirty little secret. <laughs> <laughs> Please. I can't possibly know a thousand recipes. I barely remember what book it's in, let alone how many cups of olive oil are in the recipe. But before I start to do a recipe on TV, I re refresh my memory about the recipe and I turn to my director and I say, there's no way I'm going to remember all of these ingredients. And she said, you always do. And I said, I know I say that all the time, but this one, I'm never going to be able to remember it. And she said, we'll just start and see how you go. And then I run right through the entire recipe. <laughs> 
<laughs> and she said, see, I told you. I'm like, well, that was unusual. <laughs> <laughs> no. But I do it. I've been doing this for almost 20 years. Every single recipe, I say the same thing to her. <laughs> well, to me, as someone who I, I'm not a trained chef, but I can tell you in complete honesty that I learned how to cook reading your books. Every year I've asked for a cookbook from you. Thank you. Uh, my boyfriend is like, okay, the shelf is about to collapse. Do we have to get the new one? I'm like, of course we have to get the new one. Don't be ridiculous. <laughs> but what it was interesting to me as I was reading about you is that you actually find cooking difficult. Is that accurate? Totally accurate. You know, I'm not a trained professional chef. I never worked on a line. And when you work on a line and you grill something over and over and over again, you can touch it. You know the way they say, oh, touch it. It feels like the inside of your thumb. I don't know what that means. <laughs> Or season to taste. What does that mean? I have no idea. So I'm really specific about things. And I also know that if it's complicated or hard to find the recipe, the ingredients, I'm not going to make it. And so it doesn't end up in the book. If I start working on a recipe and I find it's taking too long, I would say, okay, I'm done. I'm never going to make this again. So it goes in the trash. Because it's hard for me, I think in the beginning, I remember thinking, why would one, somebody want to cook for me? Because I'm really not a trained professional chef. But in fact, I think it's worked to my advantage because that's exactly it. I'm not a trained professional chef. I'm just a good home cook. Maybe I've had more experience than you have, but my experience is the same. Yeah, but I mean, you did run a very popular specialty food store. So I think you got but some I didn't professional cook work in it. You didn't at all, huh? Well, I mean, I did. I would develop recipes and I'd hand it to the chef, yeah. but I didn't. I didn't actually work in the kitchen all the time. Nice. I, if the baker was sick, I'd get a call at three in the morning and say, you, you have to come in and make a thousand baguettes. Oh boy. And I could do it, <laughs> but I didn't want to do it the second day. Right. You weren't happy about it. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't, and it's hard. Working in the kitchen's really hard. Oh, yeah. And it's that repetition that really kind of, I know how to do everybody's job as well as they did, but I liked doing things that other people couldn't do. Business plans and display and how to develop new recipes, uh, that kind of thing. You know, one of the things I loved about this book, uh, Marisol, I think you saw it too, is when you first thumb through the first couple of pages, it's something you bring up that I don't think enough people talk about. And it's just having good ingredients and talking about mm -hmm. what good ingredients are. And I think it's very helpful probably to a home cook to have something like that in there. Well, one of the things I do regularly is I get like six olive oils and I just taste them all at one time. I'm going to use all the olive oils, but at least I know next time I need olive oil, there's one that's the best one for me. And olive oil has huge variation in flavor. Yeah. You know, so some are kind of musky and some are kind of sweet and, and fruity. And I, I'll choose the one. In fact, recently we had a, I mean, it was a tough day at the office, but we did it. We had a chocolate tasting. Oh, because forever, Poor thing. Oh, I know, <laughs> I know, I know you feel sorry for me, but what can I tell you? <laughs> um, I had been using lid semi-sweet chocolate for a mm -hmm. long time, actually bittersweet. And I just thought, you know, maybe my taste has changed over the past 10 years. I'm just going to do, go out and get Valrona and Calibo and yeah. Lint and Ghirardelli, you know, just get a range of chocolates and taste them all. So we had a blind taste testing. And my assistants and I all liked the same one. And it was Lint. Wow. So it just confirmed that we've been using the one that we really like. That's so great. that's why, I, that's why I recommend it. And sometimes a good ingredient is Hellman's mayonnaise. Mm -hmm. It doesn't have to be something really expensive. It just has to be what I think is the best in this category. And of course, you know, if it's too expensive, buy something that's the best quality that you can afford that you feel comfortable buying. And to that point, Ina, because I know on your show, you say, or even in your cookbooks, use good olive oil. And I remember mm -hmm. thinking, oh my gosh, what is the good olive oil? But you lay it out in a lot of your cookbooks. Mm -hmm. I love that I've been invited into your pantry. You've showed yeah. me your mixing bowls, your glass ones, your metal ones, your rolling pins, your, your sheet pans, your KitchenAid, the whole thing. So thank you for doing that public service. Oh, you're welcome. That's really nice. And I try never to have something that everybody can't buy, either at a hardware store, a cookware store, William Sonoma, Sula Tablo, something like that. I mean, I'd love to have a, you know, like a wood burning pizza oven in the backyard, but I just know that I'll never be able to use it for a book. So why bother? Plum has one, so you can go borrow his. Oh, really? <laughs> I would love to make you pizza. Oh, <laughs> I'll be right there. <laughs> I, know, I think that what's interesting when you talk about these things, about having items and things that make your food taste better really are approachable by so many people. And I think when people watch you, not that I can speak on 
behalf of every human roaming the earth, but we look at you and we say, I know that person. She is my friend. She is my cousin, my sister, my aunt, my mother. What do you go into every taping? What sort of sensibility do you go into it with? You know, because I can tell you I'm a broadcast journalist and people say, what are you thinking before you go on air? I'm thinking of nothing. I'm thinking, gosh, I hope I don't sneeze on live television. Or I hope, I hope, you know, if teleprompter goes out, I know that I know this person and I will be able to ask him or her questions extemporaneously. But what are you thinking as you approach each episode, whether you're making that engagement chicken or you're making, you know, swordfish with that delicious Caesar salad dressing? What, what is going on in that noggin of yours? Sheer terror. <laughs> it's you know when when I first I started filming and I just you know I kept saying no I don't want to do this yeah. lose my number this is not interesting I cannot believe that you turned down the Food Network executives how many times was it before I know they they said to me people send us hams to try and get on the Food Network <laughs> <laughs> and you're trying to get off <laughs> they're, I mean they're very sweet to me so I had agreed to do 13 shows and I thought, okay, they'll find out that I'm terrible at this. I'll never be able to do it. But at least then I don't have to have this conversation again. And that was 2002. <laughs> After the first, we taped the first show and my production company is from England. So they, they all live in London. They come twice a year and they sent the film back to London to have it edited and then sent it back while I was still filming so I could see it. And I remember thinking, no, not as bad as I feared. <laughs> I mean, it was obviously I didn't love it, but I mean, I didn't think it was terrible, and um, which is probably my highest compliment. <laughs> <laughs> and, and at some point, I said to my director, "You know, if it's not terrible in the beginning, it's going to be better as I go along." And she said, "Not necessarily." Mm -hmm. She said that it's kind of fear, that kind of anxiety about being on camera, really makes you show up. Mm -hmm. And it really works on film. And the good news is I still feel the same thing I felt 18 years ago, yeah. that I'm wow. just like, I'll never be able to do this recipe. <laughs> I won't remember it. I won't have something to say. It won't be good enough for me. And, and that's the way we've been doing the show. <laughs> I love it. It's like still having butterflies when you see your lover. You yeah. still get a little nervous before you go to shoot something. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> it's important. I think that's what that's how that's what makes you get better at it. The day you're not nervous anymore, you should quit doing it. Exactly. Yeah. Ina, so I got to ask you, when you're doing the book, Modern Comfort Food, I'm sure there's lots of these recipes that you've done on the show, of course, a million times, or different versions of the recipes. Are there anything in particular when you think comfort food that pops out to you? You know, I think like, you know, growing up, I think Brunswick stew, I think chili is like what things pop out to your brain when someone says comfort food? I think we all go back to what we remembered as kids, what we had. And to me, tomato soup and a grilled cheese sandwich feels like comfort food, chicken yeah. soup. I did a chicken pot pie soup in the, in the book, those kinds of things. And I remember my grandparents lived in Brooklyn long before Brooklyn was cool. And um, <laughs> they would they would always buy me black and white cookies. So I thought I wanted to make really good black and white cookies, that kind of thing. And it's matter of fact, I, I was, while we're on the subject of my production company from London, I was working on this book and they were here. And I said, I'm you know, going to make something peanut butter and jelly sandwich kind of thing. And they said, oh, that's disgusting. Who would oh eat a gosh. peanut butter and jelly sandwich? What? I'm like, what did you used to eat when you came home from school? And they said, oh, we used to have like white bread with canned baked beans spooned onto them with, with <laughs> craft singles as a sandwich. No. I'm like, that's revolting. No. Oh my gosh. No. I said, no, 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 we'll make it for you. It's so good. And they made it for me. I took it back to my what we call the green room. <laughs> and I was like, there's no way I'm eating this. <laughs> that sounds awful. Doesn't that sound awful? And that's what British kids eat for lunch. Boy. Wow. I guess we shouldn't hate on it until we try it, Manasal. I don't know. Mm, I, it... Trust me. <laughs> stick to peanut butter <laughs> and jelly. Stick to PB&J. <laughs> Well, we started yeah. this conversation talking about that giant cosmopolitan you made on Instagram. And honestly, I'm still I'm on Amazon trying to find the glass just so I can make one myself. It's a vase, isn't it? <laughs> uh, yeah, it's probably. It, it's more, you know, I think drinks can also be comforting. Mm. You know, I mean, especially for me as a chef. I mean, listen, believe it or not, I like to have a beverage every now and then. <laughs> That's how I maintain my Adonis-like figure. Um, you have a hot spiced apple cider, which is just when it's cold outside, you can't pick a better cocktail than this. 
It's really great. And what I do is I take good apple cider, you know, like from the apple orchard or you can buy it in grocery stores now and steep it with like um, peppercorns and cloves and star anise and some orange peel and get all of those flavors into it and then pour it into a glass. Maybe if I feel like a little splash of bourbon in it, because that bourbon has like a really sort of a caramelly flavor that goes really well with apple. Beautiful. I kind of want that now. That sounds... (laughs) So delicious. See, I did remember that recipe. You see? (laughs) You have it in you. I know you have it in you. In fact, you'll love this because um, Faith Middleton interviewed me in Boston a few years ago, maybe four or six years ago, a few books ago. Mm -hmm. And she brought the books with her and she had post-it notes on all of them. And I remember she said, you know what? I, I just decided instead of talking about your career, let's talk about recipes. Like, why did you choose the herb that you chose for the string beans with whatever it was? And I'm like, oh, oh my God, I'm gonna have to remember what the herb was. And what popped into my mind is time. Oh, I and I was it. like, well, I put time in there because of this and that. And I was like, phew, I got that recipe right. I know which herb you did not use. Cilantro. Cilantro. (laughs) (laughs) For for listeners, for those of you who don't know enough about Ina, if you're not part of her Facebook fan club, you know two things. One, she hates cilantro, but she loves Jeffrey, her husband. (laughs) Do you know that there's a a group on Facebook of Barefoot Contessa fans? Oh, yes. And in order to get into the club, you have to pass those two tests? I keep I keep getting rejected. It's fine. I'm just going to tell them that I spoke to you. You keep, keep getting rejected? <laughs> I keep getting rejected. Why? You know, you're from Brooklyn. I'm from the Bronx. Maybe there's like a rivalry. I have no <laughs> idea. I am an intrepid journalist. Would I will you... <laughs> get to the bottom of this. Maybe you need a sponsor. How about if I sponsor you? <laughs> exactly. Exactly. <laughs> That's what's going to happen. That's hilarious. You're listening to our conversation with the one and only Ina Garden. She's just written her 12th cookbook and has hosted her Food Network cooking show, Barefoot Contessa, for almost 20 years. Coming up, we'll talk a little more about Ina's career and get into some of the recipes from her latest cookbook, Modern Comfort Food. It's like bacon and cream and pasta. (laughs) So good. And I thought, okay, how can I approach this and make it fresher, lighter, and more delicious? I'm Marisol Castro. And I'm Chef Plum. You're listening to Seasoned. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Season Del Marisol Castro. And I'm Chef Plum. We're spending time with perhaps the most famous home cook in America, Ina Garten. In a minute, we'll get into Ina's recipes for the ultimate beef stew and a lightened up pasta carbonara. And she'll share recommendations for essential pantry staples like kosher salt, canned tomatoes, and of course, pasta. But first, let's find out more about Ina's background how her government work in the 70s and her interest in science transferred over to cooking and recipe creation. I worked in the area of science and nuclear energy policy. I really loved science. So I think my interest in science really translates to cooking because I, I find taking a recipe, changing two things, either process or ingredient and see what it does to the recipe is really interesting to me. And the other thing is when you work for the president, you want to do the best job you can possibly do. You have a sense of the importance of it. And I think that really is a very good basis for having your own business. So I think those two things travel over. And food makes people happy. Yeah, it does. It really does. Yeah. Nuclear energy doesn't. (laughs) (laughs) But I did have a a wonderful experience. Um, Mrs. Obama invited me to do something in in their second term to come back and cook for kids for the Easter egg roll. And I said to her when I left here... In 1978, I remember thinking, what's going to become of me? Craziest thing I ever thought to do is to leave a great job in the White House to open a grocery (laughs) store. Um, (laughs) Or at least that's why my father described it. And uh, it was just so nice to be invited back as a cook. Kind of came full circle. Do you remember what you cooked for them? Um, Yeah, I made guacamole. There you go. That's what I'm talking about. Crowd pleaser, (laughs) easy. Let's bang it out. Kids like it, and it's good for them. No cilantro. <laughs> <laughs> hey, that that hurts my soul a little bit. That's, oh, I'm sorry. That's the chef in me, Ina. I can't help it. But I found it in the book, and then, of course, I had to YouTube you making it, of course, was your beef stew. 
ultimate beef stew. That is a way to my heart. I've told my wife she still refuses to make it because she doesn't want to touch raw meat. That's a whole other story. <laughs> I love how you use short ribs in that. And instead of searing them in the pan because it makes such a mess, you do them in the oven. I do. Yeah. You know, that's a perfect example of what I did in this book as I took the idea of something that we all knew from childhood as beef stew. And maybe it came out of a can or maybe your mother made it. I'm assuming your mother made it. And it was okay, but it wasn't really exciting. And the beef was a little tough. And I thought, okay, I'm going to revisit that recipe and take apart every single piece of it and see what I can make more delicious and easier to make. So I substituted short ribs for the beef, for the chuck, which has much more flavor and it flavors the sauce as well. And then I, I took two ingredients from beef bourguignon, which is basically French beef stew, red wine, a lot of red wine and uh, cognac. And it just made such a difference. Did you make it or were you just thinking about making it? I'm going to do my my version of your recipe of that, I think, here this weekend here at my house because it's going to be cold here in Connecticut. Yes. Oh, that's great. And and as you said, instead of searing the, the beef in a pan, I just put it on a sheet pan, Yeah. olive oil, salt, and paper into the oven. And so it gets nice and browned and you have all the juices from that you can put into the stew. But it's so much easier and you don't end up with a mess in your kitchen. Absolutely. And when I saw you doing it, I was worried about the fat content. I was like, that's going to make just a total mess on top of the of the stew as it cooks yeah. down. But what I loved is that you actually took the time and you're spooning some of it off and getting rid of it. So it's not all on top of it, which I think is that extra step that shows the care about it. Thank you. I hope you love it. It's a good one. I can attest I have made it and it is delicious. Oh, good. Um, we're talking about short ribs. I just want to plug your weeknight bolognese, which is in heavy rotation at my house because you can buy <laughs> ground meat relatively inexpensively. You put yeah. that crushed tomatoes over and it's like, voila. I wonder if you could talk to us about, as you were talking about changing up a cut of meat, what sort of drives you to take all these recipes that you have and make them comfort food? How do you zhuzh them up, make them different, or just keep them the same? Well, I start with an idea like the beef stew. I start with an idea of something that is remembered and then think about what can be done with it. Like another example is um, pasta carbonara. It's like bacon and cream and pasta. <laughs> That's so good. Like, I mean, you can have two bites of it and you're like, need a nap afterwards. <laughs> and I thought, okay, how can I approach this and make it fresher, lighter, and more delicious? And so I added green vegetables, spring green vegetables, asparagus and julienne, sugar snap peas and things like that, that would lighten it up and give it more texture and less cream. And so that's what I ended up with. And in the process, I actually used the carbonara sauce as part of a pizza. I had gone to Danny Meyer's restaurant, um, Marta, and they had on the menu a Brussels sprouts pizza. And I thought, how do you put Brussels sprouts on a pizza? Right. And they were shaved Brussels sprouts. And I thought, I can do that. That's the way to do it. So I took the pizza dough that I use, or you can just go buy some pizza dough. You don't have to make your own uh-huh. and put the carbonara sauce on it and shave Brussels sprouts. And it's like crispy and sweet. And yeah. it's just delicious. Absolutely delicious. I can imagine those Brussels sprouts getting nice and crispy on top with that sauce. That sounds amazing. And you don't have, even have to do them by hand. You can put them in, in the feed tube of your food processor oh, yeah. and it goes zoop, and it's done. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. You know, one of the recipes I did recently make of yours, uh, of a take on it, was your your chicken pot pie soup with puff pastry. I'll tell you, as a professional chef, we tend to overthink things too much. What I loved about this recipe, the two parts of it I loved the most, was using puff pastry dough number one. Mm -hmm. So smart. Thank you. Um, (laughs) Made me feel silly. I was like, of course you should use puff pastry. So easy. Yeah. (laughs) And you cooked your chicken separately and then shred it and put it into the mixture, which I thought was a fantastic idea. I've, I've always cooked it all together like a stew. Yeah. I always had it in my mind that I wanted to test it, Um, is what's the best way to make chicken for chicken salad or chicken soup? Yeah, good good question. And so one day I just cleared the decks and I just said, okay, I'm going to roast it. I'm going to poach it. I'm going to boil it. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I I had all these different methods. I'm going to do it on the bone, off the bone. And by far the best way was chicken breasts on the bone with the skin on, olive oil, salt, and pepper into the oven, I think 30 minutes. And you end up with the most flavorful chicken because I think the seasoning gets into the meat yeah. and the most tender chicken because it's the water isn't taking away all the flavor from it. So I use that over and over again now. And I did that in, in the chicken pot pie soup. Yeah, just roasting that chicken. Because by the time you boil the stock, the chicken has no flavor anymore. 
Yeah, absolutely. The flavor's all in the water then. But when you roast yeah. that chicken, you also get that crispy skin, which you can pull off and use as a garnish. That's what I liked. Oh, that's good. <laughs> <laughs> Ina, can we, get, good idea. can we get back to your good ingredients? We know you love a good olive oil. Mm -hmm. But I think listeners would be interested to know what some staples they can really put in their pantry, because I just learned recently that there actually is a difference in salt. I believe you use diamond crystal kosher salt. I do. There's a huge difference in salt. And the best way to never forget this is to go out and buy a lot of salts, like Morton's, like regular table salt. It has like a little metallic taste that I find a little harsh. I only use kosher salt, but if you use David's kosher salt, it's a different saltiness than diamond crystal. So all of my recipes are done with diamond crystal kosher salt. So if you're using a different one, you have to really be careful, make the adjustment. What about canned tomatoes? Canned tomatoes, I use um, San Marzano canned tomatoes. I find them consistently really good. And, you know, I use different kinds like whole canned tomatoes, um, crushed canned tomatoes, and diced canned tomatoes. Pasta? Pasta, I generally use to Checo. I find that really good consistently good and available everywhere. These are things that you can really buy almost anywhere. And my guide is, I mean, I know I can buy it in East Hampton or LA, but can you buy it in Kansas City? <laughs> and I just want to be sure that people can find it. And a few things maybe I'll, I'll recommend like truffle butter that you can order online, get six of them and leave them in the freezer. Yes. I've, I've been known to go shopping at the grocery store and I see truffle butter and I say, oh, Ina told me to get that. I'm going to go get that now. <laughs> I don't buy 17, 17 different types to try them at home because, you know, I'm a single mother with two boys. But I have to say, Truffle butter is like the best deal on the planet Oh yeah, because it's a little pot of three ounces of truffle butter and it's got actual shaved white truffles in it. And it's so good. It flavors as an entire dish. If you're searing scallops and you do mashed potatoes with truffle butter underneath it, they're fabulous. Or a pasta with white truffle butter. It's just fabulous. I love this. It's just $6 and it makes it really special. I know. And you'll use it. I'll like scrape the bottom until it's completely done. I may have like even licked it, but that's, you know, that is neither here nor there. Oh boy. So tell us about, I know your, your turkey made headlines. Wow. That sounds so, so lascivious. Your turkey made headlines. Your turkey for Thanksgiving. It, it was this beautiful piece of turkey. Thank you. So obviously we're changing the way we do holiday dinners. Mm -hmm. You managed to find one that was user-friendly and very appropriate for 2020. So can you tell us about that turkey? I was able to, I ordered it way in advance and I, I was able to get, I think it was nine pound turkey. It was great for two people. And then we had turkey sandwiches and all, turkey soup and things like that afterwards. But actually the other thing I've been doing is doing a spatchcock turkey, which is butterflying it. And what's amazing about that is that because it's an even thickness through the whole thing, I do it on a, put a baking rack on a sheet pan. Um, the whole thing cooks in an hour and 15, an hour and 30 minutes. Uh -huh. And we're so used to thinking, oh, it's, I have to put the turkey in the oven at 5 a.m. So it'll be ready in the afternoon, which is crazy. So I actually had, I was um, being interviewed by a wonderful man who was writing an article for Elle magazine. We were talking on Thanksgiving morning and he was making Thanksgiving dinner. And he said he had put the turkey into the oven and stuffed it. And he said, he thought it would be like five or six hours. And I, was like, <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> no, not when you stuff it. <laughs> and, and I said, no, I think probably more like three or three and a half would do it. But then I realized he'd stuffed it. And when you stuff a turkey, in order to get the stuffing cooked, the turkey has to be overcooked because you want to stuff, you know, you want to make sure there's no bacteria in the, in the stuffing. Right. So I said, okay, take the turkey out of the oven, take the stuffing out, put it in a pan with some, with some chicken stock or turkey stock, whatever you have, yeah, and then put the turkey back in the oven. And he said it took like three or three and a half hours. It was perfect. See? So I think that's what's changing is that we're realizing a turkey doesn't have to be a dry, stringy thing. It can be like a big roast chicken. Yeah, yeah. That's true. I mean, if you can roast a chicken, you can roast a turkey. And I, I'll tell you, starting exactly. about three years ago, I gave up on roasting chickens. I deep fry mine now outside. Little bourbon, sit outside, deep fry it. It is the most delicious. <laughs> it's bourbon for you or the or the turkey. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's it changes everything when you do it that way, and I love it so much. And my family loves it. Everything stays so moist and juicy, and about an hour and fifteen minutes, pff, 
rock and, and roll. And yeah, it's fast, and roll. right? Yeah. But one of the things that mm-hmm. I thought was really cool, what Minasol was just bringing up with it being different in the holidays, your turkey roulade. What a great recipe, this Tuscan turkey roulade, Thank where you, you can take the stuffing. And I guess you're still kind of stuffing the turkey because you're going to just put it right in there and roll the whole thing up. Well, I have two different ones. In this in this one, I have Tuscan turkey roulade where it's herbs and, you know, like Tuscan herbs like porchetta. Yeah. Um, in an earlier book, I actually have one where it's boneless turkey breast and you put the stuffing in and roll it up. So instead of struggling with a turkey where you have to carve it and everybody's watching and, right. you know, just you can, all you have to do is just slice it and it's perfect. Easy. And it lasts. That's the thing. And you get that crispy skin on the outside mm-hmm. and it looks beautiful when you slice it. Uh, I think it's a great option. It's, it's kind of bringing back one of those old school recipes, like a chicken roulade or something like that. And doing it with turkey and making it. I mean, I think it still looks cool when you tie it up and bring it out. It still like has that presentation, you know? Oh yeah. It looks great. Slice it. Oh, what a, what a fantastic way. Totally. Absolutely. What do you guys cook for Christmas? I grew up in a Puerto Rican family. There was nothing Puerto Rican on the menu. Uh, my sister does the Feast of the Seven Fish. Her husband is Italian. I do go shop. I'm her sous chef. So we go down to Arthur Avenue in the Bronx. Yeah. We get all manner of mussels and this and that and this and that. But then on Christmas Day, I make a standing rib roast because isn't that easy to cook? That's really great. <laughs> Christmas Eve at my house, if I don't make like a ham for my girls, I have three daughters. If I don't make a ham for my girls, they get so upset at me. I tried to switch it up one time. I was like, oh, we'll do some crab legs and make it a festive. They were like, where's the ham? <laughs> and it's the simplest thing. I do a little brown sugar, Dr. Pepper, black peppercorns and make a glaze out of that. And, yeah. put it over, and they just love it. That's great. Do you start with a smoked ham or a, or a fresh ham? I got to be honest with you now with having the kids and everything. I, I buy one already. You're just going to glaze it and pop her in the oven. That's great. And there's no reason not to. Right. It's delicious. That's what I do too. It's funny how as a chef, I feel like I have to apologize for that. You don't have to, there are no <laughs> confessions there. For, forgive me, mother, for I have sinned. <laughs> <laughs> We're talking with Ina Garten, Food Network legend and author of a dozen cookbooks. When we come back, desserts. Plus, veggies can be comforting too, especially in Ina's hands. I'm Marisol Castro. And I'm Chef Plum. Right now, you're going to hear from our producers, Robin Doyanakin and Katie Talarski, about how you can support Connecticut Public Radio. I'm Robin Doyon Aiken, jumping in with Katie Talarski. It is our great joy and pleasure to produce Seasoned every week with Marisol Castro and Chef Plum. If you are enjoying their conversation with Ina Garten, please support us. Go to wnpr.org slash donate, or if you're a phone person, 1-800-584-2788 is the number to call to support Seasoned and the local shows and news you hear on Connecticut Public Radio. Today's show is all about comfort food, and I think a lot of listeners would agree that Connecticut Public Radio is the audio version of comfort food. I don't think that's a stretch. Certainly on Seasoned, we've tried to bring a little comfort. Over the past few weeks, we've featured recipes for brisket and a whole roast chicken and apple pies and warm cocktails. Um, Another Food Network star, Manit Chohan, was a guest on the show recently, and she shared her chicken noodle soup and lamb meatballs in a spicy sauce. Now, that's definitely comfort food. The number two call to support programs like Seasoned and all of the programs you hear on Connecticut Public Radio is 1-800-584-2788. Or, of course, you can go online to wnpr.org slash donate. Robin, it's been so much fun working on the show with you because I am not a foodie, as, I, as I've said before, um, but I'm learning a lot. And I'm, you know, I've, I have my, you know, my New York Times food recipe app and I'm, I'm just, you know, it's, it's, it's inspiring me to to try a little bit more and also to know about all the restaurants in the state. We highlight a lot of different restaurants. We hear from a lot of different cooks and you know that sort of inspires me to like, oh, maybe I'll get takeout at a different place or at a place that, you know, we've mentioned, but I hadn't heard of before. So, you know, we hope that this show also, you know, brings you some joy, inspires you to get involved with some of the local restaurants in your community, whether it's just like getting takeout or whatever makes sense getting some joy out of out of listening and maybe a little bit of an escape from the news. Robin, you said that Connecticut Public Radio was the audio version of comfort food. Yeah. And I was thinking like 2020 what had nothing to do with comfort. I mean, I guess we all ate a lot of comfort food because we we're so stressed out, but like this was actually probably a good time to be launching this show because 
um, you know, people are at home and had a lot of time to cook. And also, you know, there's a need to, to sort of support those local restaurants. So again, call us now, support season, support Connecticut Public Radio, 1-800-584-2788 or wnpr.org slash donate. We know you want to get back to the conversation with Ina, so we'll try to be brief. Let me just remind you about a couple of thank you gifts. You don't have to pick a thank you gift when you make your pledge, but for my foodie friends who would like one, there are pint glasses and mugs and tumblers because public radio listeners are are beer and coffee lovers. True story. You can pick your favorite show's tote bag and take it to the grocery store, or you can pick a one-year digital subscription to New York Times Cooking. All of those gifts are available to you or someone on your Christmas list when you support Connecticut Public Radio. The number to call is 1-800-584-2788 or visit wnpr.org slash donate and flip through all of the thank you gifts and reward yourself for supporting an essential service that you use every day, perhaps while you're drinking that mug of coffee. That's right. I love those mugs. 1-800-584-2788 or wnpr.org slash donate. Um, I'm loving this interview with Ina Garden. Um, I've heard of her, but I hadn't really listened to her in an inter- interview before. And she is so excellent. And just her her approach to cooking is so relatable to me. So I'm very excited to go uh, dig into more of her work and read all of her many, many, many cookbooks. And that's something that, you know, in season, we try to mix it up with, you know, we have a call-in show once a month to, so you can get involved in the conversation we have these high profile cookbook authors and then we have you know the local folks in your in your community who are doing amazing things so you know we're trying to cover all the uh, different exciting things about cooking um, here in the state and beyond again support that now 1-800-584-2788 or wnpr.org/donate and thanks Welcome back to Seasoned. I'm Marisol Castro. And I'm Chef Plum. We're thrilled to be spending this hour with Ina Garden talking about her perfectly timed book, Modern Comfort Food. You know, veggies can conjure comfort too. Most people don't think of a salad as being something that makes them feel warm and cozy inside. <laughs> <laughs> or roast carrots. But you can really add things, you know, to vegetables to make them feel that way. Right. And so that's what I, I played around with doing that. Like Emily's fried potatoes. I was just going to say like, Emily Blunt's. Oh yeah. my God. So for anybody that doesn't know, probably one of the most favorite episodes I've ever done was my friends, Rob Marshall and John DeLuca were the producer and director of Mary Poppins Returns. And Emily Blunt and Lynn Manuel and Miranda were the leads. And so I decided, wouldn't it be fun if we did a, a show with all of them? So they all came to cook with me. That's amazing. And Lynn, of course, doesn't cook at all. <laughs> So on the way out, although you showed him green beans, you showed him how to make those green beans. I see. So I told him that he had to cook haricot vert. So on the way out, he's filming himself going, "I don't know. I have to make something called haricot vert. I have no idea what that is." <laughs> 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 and it was so clear that these four people loved each other so much, and they had so much together. So she shared the potatoes with me, which are actually steamed, yeah, and then shaken up in the pot. And then allow, this is the key thing, it's allowed to dry out so that there's no moisture in it. Very important. Hot oil goes in the pan and you toss the potatoes in the hot oil and roast them. And that's what her mother makes for Christmas every year. Oh, that's great. That was a trick I learned that she put the oil in the roasting pan. In the pan. Exactly. Which was, I was like, why have I never done that? That makes complete sense. Yeah, just, just to heat it up. It's, it was great. I actually posted it during when I was doing all the recipes for, you know, when people are in lockdown and it literally crashed my website. (laughs) We had to get another cloud just for that. Holy cow. (laughs) It was crazy. Who knew potatoes were so powerful? Yeah. (laughs) Potatoes and cocktails. (laughs) (laughs) Hey, just bringing up the cocktail thing. I got to tell you, I've watched this several times. You and Seth Meyers out drinking at the bar. Are you kidding me? It is the best thing on the internet right now. It was so much fun, but I was the worst guest he ever had. No. <laughs> Somebody asked him, who drank the most? And he said, Rihanna. <laughs> and who drank the least? He said, oh, that's easy. I need garden. <laughs> I was just, I, starting out, I said, well, I feel like I've been invited to a fraternity party. <laughs> I was like. <laughs> kind of. I have to say, he was hilarious. He drank everything you saw him drink. And I think the chef took pity on me. 
and sent out hamburgers. Oh. And we're sitting on two stools, like eating these hamburgers. And I'm eating mine like, you know, like this. And his is like flying all over the place. <laughs> <laughs> and he later, later said, Ina ate hers like a, you know, like a person eats a hamburger. And I ate mine like a raccoon. Which <laughs> 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 just so great. He's a doll. And did you say there was a test that we had to guess A, B, C, or D? I had no idea about any of the answers. And whoever missed it, the other person had to Drink. do right. a shot. And I think I got every single one of them right. Yeah, it was for fear of having to do a shot. That's how you got them all right. <laughs> That's how he was. <laughs> and then he tried to decorate a cake afterwards. That was so, hysterical. That, that was a, it was very funny. My goodness. Can we take a, a hard left I have no way to gracefully segue into this. Pasta. <laughs> yeah, that was good. <laughs> pasta is al already comforting, but why the inclusion of that? What are you doing to pasta to make it comforting and also kind of user-friendly to folks? Well, like rigatoni with lamb ragu is so good. And what I like about that too is you can make the lamb ragu in advance, make the whole dish and put it in the refrigerator and then throw it in the oven. That ragu is probably even better the next day. Yeah, exactly. Your mac and cheese also had quite uh, a coming out party during the pandemic. <laughs> <laughs> that was the other thing that crashed with my website. For our listeners who aren't familiar with it, tell us what the mac and cheese is that broke your system. It was overnight mac and cheese. So I made the mixture with milk and cream and cheese and cooked the pasta, put it in into the mixture and refrigerated it overnight. So the pasta really absorbed all the flavors and then poured it into a dish the next day and baked it. And it was just delicious. So, so yummy. How about that? Mm -hmm. And, you know, there's something where you can make mac and cheese in one go. And I thought, well, why is somebody going to want to make it overnight? But it was so good. And it really wasn't more work. You just had to plan ahead. I love it. I will say this, that my children sort of, you know, they liked the blue boxed macaroni and cheese. And I made your mac yeah. and cheese when they were young enough to not really question me. And yeah. they were like, mommy you're like a chef. And I was like, why, yes, children. Oh, no. Why, yes, I am. <laughs> Little did they know. <laughs> I'm, so I'm so like fl flipping through your pages like, okay, what did she do that? Am I using stale white bread? What am I doing with, the, with this whole thing? So it's a... Uh... I think a lot of recipes just don't have enough flavor for me. Somebody once said to me, a, a chef in a lo local restaurant said, the two things that most people get wrong when they're cooking are two things that they ha everybody has in their house, salt and pepper. Yeah. Season your food. They're just not seasoned enough. And so that's why I measure everything. And I don't just say salt to taste. That's a big difference in restaurant cooking as opposed to home cooking. And there's no reason why you can't fix it. Yeah. That and the other trick is when you're using eggs in a re recipe, like your vanilla scented pound cake, crack the eggs in a measuring cup and then slowly pour them into your yeah. mixing bowl. That's a good do one. You know, I do that because if you get a bad egg, you don't want to ruin the entire thing. And, you know, I've been cooking for a long time, many decades. And literally last week, I got a bad egg for the first time. No! Did you really? Literally <laughs> last week. And I was like, oh, thank God I do that. Figures 2020. <laughs> 2020 <laughs> year. brought Ina Garden the first bad egg of her life. Isn't that amazing? It was literally the first time it's ever happened. I'm like, whoa. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. Well, speaking of eggs and batter, can you tell us about your desserts? What about the chocolate dipped brown sugar shortbread? Because we're going to be featuring that. I mean, one of the things that we all remember is Milano cookies. And I thought if I did it with shortbread and I dipped them in chocolate and I put some, I think I put pecans or something, chopped to put pecans on it. They're so good because it's got brown sugar and um, it's just got so much flavor. Mm. They're really good. They're like one of my favorites. And then there's the Boston cream pie, which took me like six or eight years to perfect. That's a tough one, man. I am tenacious. I'm nothing if not tenacious. And I finally was having a conversation with um, Christina Tozzi, who owns Milk Bar. Uh -huh. She said, is there something that you've been working on for a long time? And I said, I've been working on this Boston cream pie, and I can't quite get all of the parts right. You know, it's cake, and then there's pastry cream, and then chocolate. I can't get them to balance right. And the cake just needs a little more flavor. And she said, try a soak which is a syrup that you make, and then you brush it on, on each layer of the cake. And I did that, and it was good, but I just needed something else. And my assistant, Lydie, said, why don't you put some Grand Marnier in it? And I was like, bingo, that's it. And what's nice about that recipe, while it's a big recipe because you have to make the cake, you have to make the soak, you have to make the pastry cream, you can do it all a day or two in advance. 
and then just assemble it whenever you're going to serve it. So you don't have to do that whole thing when you're having a dinner party. Well, when this is all over and you can have a dinner party. I love chocolate dipped anything. <laughs> you dip anything in chocolate. I absolutely love it. No way to go wrong. <laughs> I did a video of of actually pouring the chocolate on the top of this on Instagram. And I mean, people were like, <laughs> I think Katie Couric wrote and said, I'd like to come take a bath in that. <laughs> <laughs> Man. <laughs> Ina, you write in your introduction, quote, I don't know about you, but I have to admit that these days I'm a little grumpier than I used to be. End quote. I think you were, uh, you heard a collective sigh after reading that because you said what so many of us are feeling. Mine is today. Because I think you brought a lot of happiness to us. So thank you for making us less thank you. grumpy. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Anything to do that. Thank you. And you made me feel less grumpy too. We just need a giant Cosmo and we'll be good to go. <laughs> Next time in the same place. Ina Garden is a New York Times bestselling author and the James Beard Award winning host of Barefoot Contessa, which has won three Emmy Awards and airs on the Food Network. Ina is the author of 12 cookbooks. Her latest is Modern comfort food. Ina, thank you so much. Thank you. That was really fun. Have a wonderful holiday. Visit our website to see recipes for ultimate beef stew, Tuscan turkey roulade, and those chocolate-dipped shortbread cookies. Go to ctpublic.org slash seasoned. Thank you for listening and for your support. I'm Marisol Castro. And I'm Chef Plum. Seasoned is produced by Robin Doyen Aiken and Katie Talarski. Please stick around for a few more minutes so Robin and Katie can tell you how you can support Seasoned and all the local shows you hear on Connecticut Public Radio. I'm Robin Doyon Aiken with Katie Talarski. As the producers of Seasoned, we're thrilled to have played a part in bringing you an hour with Ina Garten. She's just the best. I've learned so much about cooking from her shows and her cookbooks. Um, if you've learned a useful tip from today's show or a past episode of Seasoned, Please support us. Call 1-800-584-2788 or visit wnpr.org slash donate. That's uh, wnpr.org slash donate to support Season, support the great work um, that Robin, she's our top-notch food producer here. It's so much fun working with you, Robin, and with Chef Plum and Marisol and uh, getting these shows together. I love these longer sit-down um, interviews with with the more well-known chefs, um, but just because we get to really learn a lot more about them and hear some very, you know, specific recipes that they love and um, just the sort of rapport that Plum and Marisol have with each other. And then bringing that into these interviews, is, it sounds like we're, we're just sort of hanging out at a dinner party or something. So again, if you're enjoying that, please call us and please support the station and all the programming here, 1-800-584-2788 or wnpr.org slash donate. I love that you say it feels like a dinner party because getting together with friends for dinner is one of the things that I miss the most the last few months. And so if you could sort of supplement that feeling of, you know, being around a table and talking about food and the day and work and all that kind of stuff, if you can find like some kind of equivalent on seasoned to doing that with friends and you can kind of consider Chef Plum and Marisol your friends, your new friends, that is worth... um you know, supporting. 1-800-584-2788 is the number to call to support us. Or if you are on the web and you're surfing around looking for recipes or things to cook tonight, wnpr.org slash donate is the uh, destination to support us. And there are so many thank you items at wnpr.org. We mentioned in the last break, we've got mugs, we've got pint glasses, we are so grateful to all of you who are stepping up during a time when so many people are simply not able to donate. If you value these conversations about food and cooking and recipes, chip in and make these conversations happen by supporting the show. Absolutely any amount you're able to give is appreciated. Call 1-800-584-2788 or go to wnpr.org slash donate and, and leave us a note while you're there. Let us know if you're making that beef stew Ina shared with us. It's going to be the perfect day to hunker down and get cozy. Our web address one more time to donate, wnpr.org slash donate. And thank you.